Ladies and gentlemen, we would like to now begin the afternoon session. And you are joining the Chongsan Forum 2021. I hope that you are having a beneficial time at this session. We would like to now begin the, the, the Earth session. And this is about um, being together to win on the Earth, about uh, being able to lead a sustainable life uh, together. So another topic of us together, many people have joined us um, online. And for those of you, the online audience, we'd like to ask you to click the URL beneath the YouTube channel and you'll be able to leave a question to any of the speakers seated here. We look forward to active participation. And uh, now uh, we have uh, the line of the speakers uh, seated at the center stage. Uh, please uh, greet the speaker as uh, make introduction of each one of them. The first to be introduced is moderator, Professor Wu dong Sok of uh, the School of Law at Aju University. Thank you very much. And uh, joining us online is Mr. Manjar Subin Sundaraj who is an associate lawyer and assistant professor at the School of Law at the Christ University. Please give a big hand. Jo kyung attorney at law at One Law Partners, is here with us today. And uh, next to be introduced is uh, Che Gloria, who is the vice president of Amaranth Company Limited. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to two active discussions at the Earth session, and we'd like to now officially begin the session. And now I give the moderator the microphone. Yes, uh, good afternoon. My name is Wu Dong Sok. And uh, I am co representative of the, the, the co sponsors of the Changsan Forum. And we've been given the topic Earth Together. And our thoughts need to be translated into action. for them to be meaningful. And um, we have been living on this uh, planet, and this is a common uh, grounds for us in uh, leading a life. And uh, I think uh, the Earth has uh, become more, all the more important in, in, against the backdrop of the climate crisis. So uh, we have uh, three um, panel members joining us today, one from India. And uh, we have also the legal expert uh, from the Korean side as well. Ms. Cho Kyung is going to talk about the various rights related to environment. And um, uh, Ms. Che Gloria is going to uh, share the corporate perspective as in uh, talking about uh, this uh, uh, in uh, leading the discussions at the Earth session. And uh, I, I believe uh, that uh, there are concerns uh, that uh, uh, the pandemic uh, could spread out um, under this uh, natural environment. And uh, we have a lot to discuss today, but I'd like to allocate 10 minutes each only for the speakers. And I think that is the way for us to leave more time for uh, the general discussion. So please uh, keep to the time uh, allotted to you. And I'd like to now uh, ask Mr. Manjari Subin Sundar Raj to begin the presentation. Please uh, begin the presentation. Hello, I'm Subin from India. We'll speak a little bit about how Earth Law is read in the Indian and Maori views. The ethos and philosophy which serve as a beacon light for Indian and Maori law has been in vogue for many a century. Embellished with numerous traditions and customs, often pointed out by judges, these have been the very basis of the law. Religion and religious practices were said to lay down the basis of a value-based survival of mankind by the Supreme Court of India way back in 2002 in Aruna Roy versus Union of India. Given that every religion tries to portray the role that God plays in shaping the environment, it's quite natural that these customs and traditions do toe a similar line insofar as fostering better environmental practices, more often than not. All living beings are said to possess a living spirit according to tribal beliefs, and thus they cast a duty on man to share earth with his fellow beings. 
This is evident from the fact that inanimate objects were worshipped, especially by agrarian and tribal communities. One does notice that people living in Vedic times did afford much respect and reverence towards nature and her communities. A number of instances can be attributed to many a community in India which follow an ecocentric approach and imbibe their traditional ecological knowledge, which I would say contributes immensely to natural resource management. The Demazong Buddhist ecocultural landscape in Sikkim, the Apatanis of Arunachal Pradesh, Mehta in Maharashtra, where local efforts bore fruit in the indigenous knowledge of fishermen in Maharashtra, which led to sustainable fishing. Traditional dwellers' role in Karnataka in safeguarding bioresources, to name a few, are instances of such eco-friendly measures. Numerous folklores do highlight deeply rooted ecological consciousness that such tribes possess. The Idu Mishmi folklore says that cultivation was taught to mankind by sparrows. Hence, they were to be protected when they came down during the harvest system. The Rengma Naga folklore says that plants and animals used to plead for mercy when man wanted to kill an animal or cut a tree. Tigers were treated as brothers by the Ramu tribe. There were a number of folklores that were prevalent in the northeast, which were against hunting and killing. All these have immensely contributed in opening new doors as, so, as far as environmental conservation and developing an ecological sense is concerned. Courts in India to have grappled with cases which had posed interdivined questions about customary practices and environmental conservation. And T. M. Godavarman Tilman Part vs. Union of India, the Supreme Court had opined that environmental justice could be achieved only if we drift away from the principle of anthropocentric to ecocentric. Time and again, one notices that the Supreme Court has highlighted the socio-cultural importance that protecting the environment does imply. Be it the Tarun Bharat Sun versus Union of India, where illegal mining activity in a tiger reserve was the folk quest. Sachidanta Pandey was a state of West Bengal, where the judge quoted the retort of the wise Indian chief when the great white chief, the leader of the United States, asked for his land. All these ideals have been sought to be incorporated into law and obviously was strengthened when it was opined that ample publicity need be given for the social cultural aspects of environmental protection. This was held by the Supreme Court in the MC Mehta case way back in 1992. The Niam case, mining activities in a mountain, revered by local communities, were stopped, opened new doors. But one can, with conviction, say that the decisions rendered in Mohammed Salim versus the state of Uttarakhand and Lalit Miglani versus the state of Uttarakhand and others were similar rights as those provided for humans by given, opened a new chapter in environmental jurisprudence, which stressed on ecocentrism. Any harm cost to these entities was to be treated akin to harm caused in humans. That was the rationale that was led, that was put across in both these cases. The former provided for a legal status being afforded to two rivers, while the latter afforded legal status to glaciers, including the Demotri and the Yamuna, rivers, streams, lakes, meadows, jungles, wetlands, waterfalls. All these were treated as legal persons. Though things took a different turn in the state of Uttarakhand versus Mohammed Salim and others, where citing administrative problems, the Supreme Court stayed the order of the Uttarakhand High Court. Things have changed for the good in later decisions. In Narayan and Dutt was the Union of India and others, the Uttarakhand High Court the same judge, Justice Rajiv Sharma, held the entire animal kingdom, including avian and aquatic species, need be treated as legal entities, and cast a duty on the citizens of the state to act 
as loco parentis for their welfare and protection. One cannot but help recall that even Christopher Stone had asserted that whenever a new entity is provided rights, it is met with either ridicule or fear. Breaking free from the set order might be a difficult task, but not impossible. The Punjab and Haryana High Court in Karnail Singh was the state of Haryana, while discussing the situation in respect of animals which were being exported, came across the pitiable situation in which they were being transported. The court delved into the concept of a juristic person, read into many of those precedents that were there, and held that animals need be transported in a proper manner. A normal maintenance and treatment of animals was to be done. This was to be carried out by persons claiming custody. In Suomoto versus Chandigarh administration, where a case was taken up as a result of a letter that was sent to the court by a public spirited person, which highlighted the pitiable condition of the lake, the Sukna lake, and the failure of the administration. The court relied on many a precedent and specified that the government has a duty and so does the court as well to protect the environment. The court held that this particular lake is a legal entity, a legal person, said it to be a juristic person and for its survival, preservation and conservation was said to have a distinct persona with corresponding rights, duties, and liabilities of a living person. And the citizens of the state were appointed as guardians as well. Courts in India have gone for recognition provided in a specific case rather than providing some sort of a blanket right. Keeping track of all the international developments, courts have cited that such instances too, which it is felt augurs well, for the development of jurisprudence in this area. An amicus curiae is appointed to speak for the entities. And the guardianship principle, coupled with the public trust principle, has opened up new avenues. With increasing cases being filed on such lines, courts have also tried to cast a duty on the entire population itself relating it to the fundamental duty that has been enshrined under Article 51, capital A, G, as has been the case in all the decisions that have been mentioned earlier. Such steps have ensured that the public too gets to play an integral role in filing cases on behalf of national entities, which in turn fosters eco -sensors. The Supreme Court of India had an opportunity to delve into the matter as a public interest litigation has been filed by an NGO, the People's Charity Organization, to declare the entire animal kingdom, including avian and aquatic species as legal entities, having rights akin to a legal person. The court has sought the center's response. However, what need garner attention is that the court had opined orally that it is very unlikely that the prayer will be entertained. Now, given that this does validate Stone's observation, one need to figure out a way to circumvent the difficulty, open up newer possibilities, and get rid of cliches so that the Indian Supreme Court charts a new path. Whatever be the path that is being chosen, one can only wait and hope that the court takes due cognizance of the many developments that are on worldwide and open a new chapter in environmental law. A purely egocentric approach where humans are one among various components of nature. I wish that we reach this as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. The speaker briefed us on the traditional customs and the beliefs of India and how it is interpreted in the Indian courts and also the tasks uh, 
imposed on the Supreme Court of India with regard to dealing with this kind of tradition and trend. And now we invite Cho kyung to begin her second presentation. Uh, I'm the second speaker, Jo Kyung A. I would like to extend my appreciation to the first speaker, um, Sibin, uh, Mr. Sibin Mander, for um, his uh, explanation on the Indian cases. Today, I would like to talk about uh, the legislative cases on the rights of rivers. I'll uh, make a quick presentation. Back in 1971, Professor Christopher D. Stone released a paper under the title of uh, Should Trees Have Admiss Admissibility to a Party for Legal Rights of uh, Natural uh, Objects? And also, there was a very significant case uh, in point, which was a Sierra Club versus Merton uh, case uh, that happened uh, back in 1972. And the Supreme Court Judge Douglas actually acknowledged the admissibility of uh, trees uh, to a party for legal rights of uh, natural objects. And in 2017, the New Zealand became the first nation in the world to grant a legal personality to the Wanganui River. Wanganui, uh, the Wanganui River um, is the third longest river flowing from Mount Tonga Liro in Northern Ireland to the Tasman Sea. So when it comes to the legislation uh, regarding granting personhood to the Wanganui River, uh, actually, there is a very long history or a background. Uh, there was a, a treaty uh, made back in 1840 between uh, the British Royal Crown and the Maori chiefs. Uh, the, the treaty was called uh, Waitangi Treaty. And also there was a significant difference in terms of the uh, Maori version of the treaty and the English version of the treaty. And there has been a consistent uh, complaint raised by uh, Maori uh, tribes with regard to the request to bring justice over destructive behaviors against the river over the past 150 years. And as a result, there was a report released by Waitangi Tribunal in 1975. And also, uh, the beliefs of uh, Maori with regard to their relations with um, the natural objects, including the Wanganui River, was acknowledged with regard to the report of the tribunal. And, um, as such, granting the uh, personhood to the Wanganui River is deeply rooted in the worldview of the Maori in New Zealand. The Maori believes all existences, whether living or non-living, are connected to one another and views every element of nature as their relatives. Ko au te awa, ko te awa, ko au, which means I am the river and the river is me, which confirms how strongly the Maui people believe that their lives are associated with the river. Therefore, for them, protecting the river is protecting humans and the vice versa is all the way true. And the transfer of ownership of the lake bed from the state to the Te Arawa Lake uh, Trust uh, was um, agreed in 2006. The Waikato River is a mana, majestic ancestor, and at the same time represents the tribe's mana and Maori life force, acknowledging the concept of a river from the point of view of the Iwe. And in 2014, Te Uewera uh, law was legislated, and the law recognized the Te Uewera National Park as a legal entity that is not a state property but uh, something belonging, uh, um, I mean, um, it's not a state property belonging to the government, but has the rights of a person, owns itself, and should be managed in a respectful uh, manner. 
the Wanganui River um, has four intrinsic values, and actually those values represent the essence of Te Awa Te Pua. The river is a source of spiritual and physical survival for the nearby communities such as Iwi, and since it has the legal entity status, it not only has uh, rights but also has responsibilities for taxation. And as it was uh, mentioned before, uh, the intrinsic values that represent the essence of Te Awa Tupua, including and the river um, as a source of spiritual and physical survival for the nearby communities. And the Te Awa Tupua is an indivisible living hole from the mountains to the sea, uh, including the Wanganui River. And also, Te Awa and Tupua is a single entity composed of multiple elements of uh, elements and communities working together to achieve the common purpose of the health and well-being of Te Awa and Tupua. And if you take a look at, at the article number 14, um, the provision says that the uh, river shall be granted a legal personhood and have the same rights, authorities, duties, and responsibilities as a uh, human. And also, it seems that the uh, legal uh, rights of the river Wanganui was expressed and defined in the Western legal terms. And actually, the legislation uh, was uh, possible thanks to uh, the professor uh, Christopher's uh, article. Uh, particularly, um, actually, whether it is possible uh, or is needed to provide a legal uh, status or the admissibility to a party to natural objects. And when it comes to the uh, category of protection, those uh, who exercise their rights, powers, and obligations under certain laws should uh, recognize and provide for or have a special connection with uh, the status of Te Awa, Te Pua, and Te Pua Te Kewa. Governments have discretion in determining it. But still, the uh, law says that the government has the ownership of, of the mineral resources in waterbed. And when actually the I mean the law was legislated in uh, I mean I mean a, a decade ago there was no clear uh, definition with regard to the ownership of, of the water and other resources. But with the revision uh, made in 2020, uh, actually the ownership was clarified. With regard to the legal representation of the uh, Wanganui River, Te Awa Tupua is legally represented by the office of Te Pu Tupua. Te Pu Tupua consists of two persons jointly appointed by Wanganui Maori and the royal family, one designated by Wanganui Maori and the other um, designated by the royal family. Tupua Tupua is intended to act in the face and in the name of Te Awa Tupua. But still, um, there is a controversy over the treatment of the uh, river as uh, children or incapacitated uh, people by uh, designating representatives, uh, legal representatives. And um, as it was mentioned before, there is a kind of positive uh, evaluation with regard to the legislation saying that the right of the Wanganui River was defined in the Western legal term, however, there also is a criticism and that uh, the legal status uh, of the Wanganui River uh, was expressed in the Western uh, legal term rather than um, the, the ethnic people's languages or the legal terms. So Western societies uh, that have embraced the Western law are built on rights, just as we recognize uh, the legal rights of intangible corporations. So we can also recognize the legal rights of uh, nature. We all know that the every right holder depends his own moral conditions of existence within his rights. Uh, it was mentioned by a philosopher, a German philosopher Rudolf von Ehring in uh, 19th century. So the ownership stands for uh, legal uh, personality and legal personality stands for the right to defend one's own legal rights. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that I had no choice but to put pressure on you with regard to uh, 
time management, but still, I would like to uh, uh, thank you for keeping the time. And now we invite Ms. Gloria Chet to give us a presentation. She represents the company Amaranth. So. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I am Che Gloria, and I'm the, the deputy CEO at the Amaranth Cosmetics Company. Uh, we take our name from a uh, Greek, ancient Greek word. Uh, it's about immortality, immortal flower um, that uh, continues to bloom. And uh, I think I was invited to this uh, forum, environment forum, for one reason. Within the cosmetics industry, um, for environment, uh, for the planet, um, we have continued to make efforts, and we will continue to make the efforts. Uh, so we would like to talk about uh, the small things that we have done. I think uh, this is a small uh, um, butterfly movement, uh, but I hope to to be able to share this uh, uh, activities with you through today's conference. And um, as I said, uh, we are a company established in uh, um, Busan in 1985. We are a cosmetics producer, and then we uh, produce uh, by the OEM and ODM the, the contracts. We also export globally to two overseas markets. And uh, I do have a video clip prepared, uh, but I'd just like to briefly uh, mention uh, Greta Thunberg. Uh, she's a very famous 15-year-old uh, girl who um, urged uh, that we take actions about the environment. She's a very famous uh, figure. Uh, it should really shows the importance of the, the environment issue to, uh, and its impact on us. And I think we need to understand uh, uh, the changes that take place in the environment and the climate. Uh, and uh, I think with this reason, uh, because I wanted to promote uh, this uh, very important cause, I'm seated here today. And as I mentioned, um, the COVID-19 uh, has become a climate uh, catastrophe, uh, which is an invisible climate cl uh, catastrophe. And uh, this uh, catastrophe has been around us for two years. And there's been increases in the greenhouse gases emissions. And um, we, there's, uh, there's some scientists that believe that that uh, it was uh, created, the situation was uh, created because uh, uh, some parts of the world has become the places uh, quite uh, favorable for the, the bats habitat. And uh, that has led to uh, these regions uh, becoming uh, the source of uh, the COVID-19 outbreak. And many efforts have been, much efforts have been placed already, and uh, there are concerns about uh, the ESG, the, the governance issues, and so on. So I'm sure that the term ESG is something very familiar to you. And uh, many companies responded uh, to the ESG uh, cause. Within the cosmetics industry, we uh, use large volume of plastics. And plastics can be the very uh, practical and easy to use material, but in fact, uh, um, the large bulk of the plastics that we use are uh, end up as waste. And uh, we now see the the islands of uh, plastics everywhere. And uh, we believe that at the cosmetics industry. We need to, to utilize more uh, recyclable materials, uh, and uh, we should also refrain from using animal ingredients, uh, and we should therefore uh, use more the vegan uh, the, the materials. Uh, major, major companies like um, Han Korea Coma, Amore Pacific, uh, um, these are the companies that they are known to show, take the lead in taking such efforts. And we are a small regional company uh, based in the regional city, and uh, we uh, joined hands together with the Ministry of uh, Marine, and uh, we have engaged in the joint research. And, and when we launch new brands, we want to, to increase the revenue and also the subsequently the profit. But uh, we believe it's very important that uh, we take a con um, concept-based approach. We need to make sure that uh, we protect the environment and the current ecosystem is uh, kept intact as we continue our business activities. 
And at the um, cosmetics industry, uh, we have uh, these uh, two buzzwords uh, brought up often. Uh, one is vegan, and the second is uh, uh, clean beauty. Clean beauty may be a uh, new concept for many of you. As I said, this is about uh, using the raw materials. Uh, uh, and uh, there are the packaging materials and the raw ingredients they've used for the production of uh, the uh, cosmetics. It may be the, the, these ingredients are maybe used for the, to beautify people, but uh, we would like to uh, source uh, the raw materials uh, so that uh, we can contribute to, to environmental protection. And uh, when we do that in our research and development, uh, we name the product as a clean beauty. When we say that uh, we focus on vegan uh, the products, uh, what it means is that we are not going to resort to the animal the testing and animal ingredients in developing our products. So this may be small seeds uh, that uh, uh, we are um, uh, placing, uh, but uh, we are hoping that uh, the seeds will sprout into the significant uh, results in the future. And I also talked about uh, clean beauty and uh, vegan beauty. Um, so the vegan beauty is often promoted in countries like France and uh, also in Korea. Um, many companies um, promote uh, vegan products and organic products, our customers too. And um, we have a vegan the beauty the certification in France, which means uh, everything has to be vegan the right from the, the development stage to the, the, the final, the master production stage. And as I said, uh, in the Korea, major the manufacturers um, are taking part in this uh, vegan initiative. Uh, they take part in the, the vegan initiative for uh, R&D as well as uh, the production. Amaranth is a small company. But uh, we uh, have uh, launched the vegan uh, products already, and we have been certified in France in uh, April and May. Uh, we have been given award by the, the Ministry of uh, Marine and Affairs. And another concept I want to show you is blue carbon. I, I think I do have a question from the audience. Uh, do you mind if I take the question right now? Yes. Um, going back to my slide, blue carbon has to do with absorption of the carbon in the uh, marine environment. Uh, 50 times more carbon is absorbed in the marine environment, and therefore uh, we use a lot of uh, marine-based products. Um, And such as a drop of garden. Since 2005, uh, we uh, uh, focused on uh, the blue carbon concept in developing the new product. And uh, our product for children uh, are particularly uh, noteworthy to mention because uh, they are the pro environment. And um, it's not just for the protection of the skin of the children, it's uh, for the promotion of uh, protection of the environment that we resorted to, uh, this, uh, um, the maritime resources in developing our products. Uh, there are more than 600 manufacturers, cosmetics manufacturers in Korea, and there are so many brands uh, um, that uh, compete in the Korean market. Uh, we believe that uh, we give a lot of considerations to the earth, uh, the ecosystem, and the environment. We make a lot of attempts uh, within the cosmetics industry, and we want to be a beneficiary. We want to have a the positive influence. I believe that BTS is a representative of uh, the boy band that uh, want to exert this uh, positive, uh, good influence. And I think we have a lot of um, a common, uh, a lot in common with the BTS, uh, and uh, for us in the cosmetics industry, we think about the raw materials and the plastic packaging. We want to pay attention, close attention to that. And in the future, I believe that we want to focus not just on the beauty side. We want to look at the aesthetics issue as well as health. 
uh, the healthy mind and healthy uh, ideas. Uh, we want to promote that within the cosmetics industry. And uh, I have just uh, covered a lot of things uh, through the short time that I had. Uh, and uh, what I want to say is that uh, I, uh, we have high, the, the a sense of responsibility, high level of awareness about this issue, and I wanted to share those ideas with you today. And at the cosmetics industry, we are exerting our best efforts. And um, I, I did my best to explain the efforts that we exert in the uh, cosmetics industry. And I'd like to entertain the questions after the, I end my presentation here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, given the short time uh, that I have allocated, uh, thank you for giving us a lot uh, in your presentation. And uh, we have online audience, and I do believe that we have a question received from the online audience. Uh, and we will ask for one of the panelists to respond to that question. So we have about eight, nine minutes uh, before we are to conclude today's session. And more recently, from many countries around the world, uh, uh, many the countries are including a new clause to protect the environmental rights of the people in their constitutions. Is there a way that we can amend our constitutions to include this environmental right in our constitution? Yes, Ms. Cho Kyung, would you like to respond? Uh, Thank you. We are talking about environmental right. That's the right of people, not the right of nature. But still, um, this question is related to the Korean Constitution. I may be able to answer that question. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there are a, a lot of discussions made on the possible revision of Constitution to include the right to environment. Actually, such right was treated as an abstract right. However, if the revision is made to the Korean Constitution, then it can be uh, included as a, a concrete right, which protect uh, people and particularly those who are in a desperate situation. But in order to enable uh, such kind of revision, the National Assembly and the government should work uh, very hard. Thank you very much. Um, as a coincidence that I also measured in the Korean Constitution, I'd like to add a few more comments. Under the uh, current administration, there have been uh, some discussions made with regard to the revision of the constitution to include uh, environmental right or people's right to uh, environment. Here in Korea, uh, young people, particularly youth, uh, are not quite um, unsatisfied with uh, the mediocre or lukewarm attitude of the government toward uh, the environment right or right to environment. So we need to be more active in accommodating uh, the environment right in and the legal judgment and the national constitution and that is also aligned with the presentations made by uh, our lawyer uh, uh, speakers it seems that i have a question to mr uh, subin sundar uh, raji you just mentioned the term earth law and i'm just wondering uh, what's the current status of the discussion with regard to uh, the earth law in India and what is your personal interest in, in the environmental law area? Could you please answer the question? Thank you. Now, to speak about uh, earth law in India, I think it's it's been a difficult choice, especially since courts in India have not taken due cognizance of this particular right. We don't have a definite right as such in the constitution either. We have a right to live in a healthy constitution. It's been read under Article 21, which gives, which speaks about the right to life. But then unfortunately, the environment as such is not given a right per se. And given those discussions that and the decisions that I did mention during my presentation, uh, the Supreme Court is still in a state of flux, I would say as far as coming to the decision. When you look into it, you get to understand and realize that the court has orally mentioned that it's highly improbable that such a right would be given. Now, all those previous decisions that was rendered by a high court has been stayed. 
the specific decisions that I did mention. So it becomes a bit difficult and a big challenge to ensure that, well, how do you actually put this into practice? When courts, and especially the Supreme Court, make such an observation, I think it becomes a bit difficult to translate this particular right into action. I only hope fervently that this right would be read into the Constitution and at least the Supreme Court comes out with a decision so as to ensure that, well, we recognize this particular right, not just a right to live in a particular, live in a healthy environment, but also a right that we can provide for the environment itself, recognition of an inherent intrinsic right that the environment has. I hope we reach the day as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the environment, uh, the right, uh, could it be expanded in, in a positive note? Uh, human beings will be at the center, and um, other the, the animals and the plants uh, could be subordinated. But so, so some criticize that, that uh, um, the, the other animals, uh, species, and plant species uh, could be marginalized because of this environmental concept. So um, that is why uh, we have to pay closer attention to the natural environment as we uh, pursue expansion of this environmental right. And I do have a question for Ms. Che Gloria um, for the businesses. You talked about uh, there was discussions about the legal uh, the, uh, the persons. Uh, uh, the, the corporations are recognized as entities, uh, legal entities, uh, legal persons, uh, and. Uh, uh, they are uh, recognized as a such entity, and therefore they do have rights and the responsibilities. Uh, but and at the same time, the companies are uh, uh, established to pursue profit, and uh, there is certain conflicting uh, uh, the nature the, to this discussion. To, as you pursue environmental the, uh, protection, to, you may end up risking uh, enhancing your the, the profit. So can I ask you to, to comment on this point as well? Yes, the companies uh, have to prioritize on the, uh, maximizing or increasing the profit. Uh, this is the most, single most important factor for the company. But uh, if you look at uh, all these uh, stakeholders uh, within these uh, businesses, uh, you have to think about uh, um, the value in the consumption. Uh, so if you uh, are going to be consum consuming as a consumer, you want to be uh, spending for uh, something valuable. Um, it, it doesn't mean that uh, we are going to be philanthropical in our activities uh, as a business, from the business perspective. Uh, we uh, want to, to Make sure that we uh, pursue profit, uh, and at the same time, we want to be able to persuade uh, to our customers that, that they are going to be healthy. They're going to be beautiful because they use this product, and at the same time, they will be healthy. I think such awareness is being increasing in the future in in, in the, the industry, and that is why many businesses are placing much emphasis in ESG management. Uh, and that will be all. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Cho, could you please give a brief answer to uh, the complaints raised by the Korean youth with regard to uh, the revision of um, the Constitution to include environmental law or right to environment? Here in Korea, there is increasing a number of uh, lawsuits uh, raised by uh, the Korean youth. Uh, with regard to the environmental right. And I believe that the same goes on in other countries, such as New Zealand and some other Western countries, particularly uh, in the case of Germany, uh, there was a certain cases where uh, the court judge that the government didn't do its due uh, obligation with regard to the accommodating and uh, the environmental rights of uh, its people. And I believe the same trend should happen uh, in Korea and uh, same uh, the judgment should be made in the Korean court. We need to recognize uh, the rights of uh, the natural uh, objects. But by recognizing um, actually the uh, legal rights of natural objects, then we can create a sustainable environment for human beings as well. Thank you very much.
And as Mr. Raj mentioned, in other countries, um, people have their uh, certain level of awareness about uh, the environment. I think this does not affect uh, the awareness. It's just about certain countries that are affected. It's about all of us. Uh, and therefore, we need to share it, um, our ideas uh, and uh, the way that we perceive environment. Uh, such things need to be shared. Uh, and uh, Mr. Raj is an active promoter of these causes in India. Likewise, we need to take such actions accordingly in the Korea. And uh, we are going to look at the environment. It has to do with the river and animals. Those non-human beings, uh, we need to think about enhancing their rights. And it is uh, because of the situation that we are placed in right now. We are facing a crisis. And we have been too human-centric. And uh, uh, what we are experiencing right now is uh, the by, uh, side effects of uh, us having been human-centric for too long. Uh, there are certain actions that we can take uh, in the future. If I may add, I believe that for all beings that are not human, uh, we are sharing uh, this place, the Earth. So it's not just about the legal rights of all of all of them. Uh, we need to uh, uh, understand the desperate uh, situ uh, how desperate the situation is, and we need to take uh, common action accordingly. We need a change in our attitude and the perception. I sincerely hope that uh, this forum is going to be a moment for us to take on such changes uh, uh, actively. With this, I'd like to conclude today's session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the moderator for the, um, the managing the session so well. And the one and uh, only Earth, um, we need to protect uh, the planet. And uh, we often forget how important, how uh, cherishable that this uh, place is. Uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to live uh, together in a very healthy manner to, uh, between the, the human beings and all the non-human species. And uh, I'd like to pull up another the visual thinking uh, drawing uh, to wrap up this session. So the, on the, a single um, the sheet of paper, we are able to wrap up uh, today's uh, discussions in this uh, session. And I do believe that um, we are going to cherish um, the memories of having engaged in the active discussions at the session. And uh, it was a reminder of our the vivid memories that were developed. We also have a special online event for the online um, the, the audience. So the, please um, don't leave us. And we will be back at 2 o'clock.